aren't able to be here tonight because they are suffering personal tragedy. We're helping others who have with the tornado that struck uh, about a week ago. Um, we are reaching out as we can and welcome your suggestions about how to include them in uh, uh, discussion forums like this. And we're very thankful that Mill City Times is videotaping this so that this uh, informational presentation will be available to them as well. For those of you who are so moved, on uh, the back of the, the agenda are some opportunities to give. I understand the volunteer day this Saturday is full, but there might be other volunteer places to give assistance. Uh, so just a moment of reflection. Uh, we have a lot of people who I think would like to be here or otherwise. At the back of the room when you signed in, uh, there's an agenda an overview of the policy review that Tom and Hyde will be doing. And then before you leave, we'd like you to fill out the Upper River Your Turn on the front, comments about uh, the Upper River and plans. And on the back, we are planning outings along the river to increase the sense of place connected to the riverfront. Um, please offer your ideas, things you'd like to do here. So leave those before you go. And then finally, uh, I hope everybody has to hand out also this wonderful map. Uh, highlighting the Minneapolis Riverfront Development Initiative that Mary will be talking about with you later. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Tom and Hyla. These two have been working uh, for the past year and a half, uh, really addressing, and they'll explain the kind of background and context for this project, but we're very thankful for the uh, in-depth research and integrity with which they're approaching this, um, and their genuine interest in having community members be aware and involved <coughs> Um, as the city reviews how it wants to proceed in the above falls area. Uh, Diane, just a wonderful. Okay. Um, I understand Diane Hofstad, our city council member from this area, is here. Diane, welcome. Um, and would you like to say hello, introduce yourself, Diane, and then we'll start with Tom and Hyla? Sure, I'd love to. Thank you. My apologies for being late. I just want to tell you what happens when there's a bus that jackknifes on um, Hennepin Avenue. It slows you down for about an hour. <laughs> so I apologize, but I'm really glad that all of you are here today uh, in this review of Angela and Diane Hofstad, the council member uh, for this area. So welcome to the third board. It's the first time that you've been here, although I see some very familiar faces. Uh, we think that this is uh, going to be an interesting discussion. We have two of our top-notch uh, planners in the city who have been working very hard on the Barbara Paul's policy, policy study and evaluation. Uh, and we're eager to have communication and discussion with you about this really important study and the work that we have before us. And of course, it's hand in glove with so much of the work that we're doing. Mary Delay is here uh, with the uh, uh, park board and the new uh, uh, work that's being done uh, and the new team uh, uh, and so we hope that you'll uh, be participating in uh, that as well uh, and so I look forward to hearing the discussion and uh, if you have questions certainly feel free to ask them and I'll, I'll be around. Great. So Thank with you. that, um, Tom and Hila will give a presentation and then we'll have a question and answer after that. Take Thank you. We're going to do a little bit of a tag team presentation. I <laughs> appreciate the uh, introduction. I uh, really appreciate the Minneapolis Open Forum Partnership and the um, Above the Bosses as Advisory Committee for, for hosting the meeting for, for the Minneapolis Open Forum. You know, I have to say that I was really struck as I was listening to people talking about their relationship to the river, how much, <laughs> one, how much collective investment there is in this room with how uh, the river develop, the riverfront uh, develops in the future, both in the, in the public space and in the private space. And some of that uh, uh, investment is very personal. You know, people own homes, people own businesses, and are, you know, some of the uh, guidance for this area is in place. Some of it's a passion on the part of some of you who've been deeply involved for years and years. So that's, that's humbling to have a room full of people that bring that level of, of buzz and interest. Al and I have uh, been working on this about a year and a half, uh, as was referenced, um, and we are at a point 
at which we can share a lot of our findings. It's a very researchy type of a project. It's not probably, the presentation is probably not going to be as fun as the way we started out there, which you could make it up on it. Very researchy type of a project. Uh, uh, has been pretty quiet, but we've learned a lot of interesting things about uh, what kind of development, um, what are some of the constraints and uh, benefits of different development types for different parts of the Upper River Front, and that's what we hope to share with you tonight. Um, so our goals are um, for you to have a better sense of what our project is involved, uh, what it involves, uh, two, to share these findings, and three, then you have a deeper sense of some of the complexities around some of those decisions and guiding development. Oh, okay, sure. I want to, um, you can, yeah, sure. I want to uh, give a nod to Tim Griff. How many of you were at the first of the Upper River Forum series about uh, six weeks ago? Saw Tim Griffin present. He did a wonderful job uh, setting, setting the context for how we want to think about our Upper River from, from a historical perspective. And this slide is from his show, it references the Grand Excursion. And the next one is from sort of placing this in more of a regional network perspective. So very big picture thinking. Um, but tonight, we're going to be clearly focused right on this stretch of riverfront. And um, we take as our starting point the existing city policy for this area, which is uh, the adopted uh, about the fall plan, adopted by both the city council and park board. This is a formal policy guidance for this area, and most of you probably know that it calls for a public edge to the river uh, throughout north and northeast Minneapolis, similar to what we have along the central riverfront and in south Minneapolis. It calls for extending the uh, trail system to both bikes and pedestrians through this area to connect downtown to the railroads. And within this area, there would be some, uh, some regional class destination parks that are going to attract. So that's the vision of the parks frontage. It also, uh, that's one. it also has uh, land use recommendations for the kind of development um, that was envisioned that would make sense with this and would make sense for the area in the long run. Uh, there are parts of the upper river front that are uh, developed as industrial development that would stay that way over the long run, uh, with the hope that in some cases we'd be able to intensify the jobs that are provided in those areas uh, through new development. There are other parts that are currently industrial or a mix of uses that would transition over a long period of time uh, to new residential neighborhoods. <coughs> so that's our starting point. Um, uh, Mary referenced 1999 as the adoption date, and now it's 2011, that's 12 years. And a lot has happened, a lot has happened to, um, to implement this plan. Uh, but certain changes in terms of the more ambitious land use changes have not happened at this point. Now that's not real surprising. They were always envisioned to be really long range changes. But the city is at a point where it is, um, it is poised to take some additional steps to further those, <coughs> those development visions. Um, and uh, the city council has decided that prior to taking uh, more assertive steps in that regard, 12 years later, they want to step back uh, and essentially think about all right, is all this guidance appropriate still? Is it the best collectively for the city? Uh, and um, is it realistic? Is it realistic? Uh, we would boil down our task. The last was a quote from the city council <laughs> that was the detail, but we boiled down our task into these three questions. Uh, the first two I just mentioned. And the third is really, um, in the areas where more ambitious change is called for, um, how can we give a sense of more um, predictability, a clearer timeline um, to uh, existing properties so that that transition can happen in other respects there um, with investing in those properties? I want to address the question of how um, this project relates to a more visible project that is taking place right now that the Park Board is sponsoring, the Minneapolis Riverfront development issue project. Um, and the, I think that's created a huge splash and brought a lot of good attention to the river and generated a lot of excitement, um, starting with the, um, uh, the design competition that the park was sponsored. Um, and it, but it's also generated some confusion on how does that relate to the 
work with city council has directed us to do in our plan. And so I try to find the most simple way uh, to illustrate that. This slide uh, is the above the falls plans uh, development scenario with the park features highlighted and the private property uh, data. The next slide is the reverse. The park features are faded, private property is highlighted. The simplest way to think about these two projects is that the former slide uh, that relates to the park features, uh, the park board is interested in updating that grand plan for, for the park system around the river. And in some cases it may, in some cases those park features may end up in different locations, uh, or they may serve different functions. Uh, but that's their primary objective. Can you please talk to us the borders there, because it's not really clear. Okay, well, so we're essentially looking at this ribbon uh, for brightly colored park features uh, right along the river, and, and it included some other parks within, within the development. Yeah, I mean, but what are the cross streets there? Oh, yeah, okay. sure. This is Plymouth Avenue, um, West Broadway, they're right on there, yes. Lowry Avenue, okay. and up to, I guess, the, the top bridge is the Camden Bridge. So that's our geography. So the um, uh, Park and Recreation Board is updating that park station, uh, and we are updating that it's related to that. Yeah. Last thing that I wanted to address is that um, I think digging back into um, the above the falls plan has caused some to say, well, a lot of work was done on that plan. Are we just starting from scratch or throwing it out? And I think it's important to say that, from our perspective, there's a real continuity of values in the work that we're doing with the with the work that was done in, in 2004. Um, we still believe that there's a place uh, where it serves Minneapolis as a whole for ambitious redevelopment scenarios. Um, still believe that though that those have to be grounded in reality, they have to be feasible uh, with uh, reasonable uh, amount of resources. Um, respect. Uh, for existing property owners is, is continues to be important as well. And the next uh, slide. So um, I think there's a lot of continuity too in what is a higher value development future need. Um, uh, we um, look for development that embraces the Mississippi and embraces and supports all those goals that we want along the Mississippi. Uh, it may employ more people in certain areas than it does now. It may house more people in certain areas it, does now. it may improve the, it should improve the appearance and movability of the area, and it should contribute to the sustainability of the area from the environment. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Sure. Great. Um, I, we're going to talk about this section is we had given ourselves the task, we've been given the task by the council to sort of refresh the analysis in the above the falls plan. And our first task was to figure out what exactly that meant, what, what was sort of on our plate, what were the areas that really needed a closer look. So what I'm going to go over now is sort of the, the range of things that we covered. It's, it's too much information to tell everything about everything, but I want to give you a, a basic overview, and then we'll go a bit more in depth when it comes to sort of what that means for development futures and the feasibility of development. Um, the first topic up here is the land. Um, this may seem like an obvious thing, well, there's dirt, there's, there's river, what more do you need to know? Um, this is a topic that on, on the Big picture doesn't matter as much, but when you get down to specific site, it matters a great deal. Um, we want to make sure that our analysis takes into account that a site, just because a site looks good from an aerial perspective, the slopes, the soils, the geotechnics can make it um, a good site for development or a site that's almost impossible. We're, we have, frankly, not finished all that development um, analysis because we are going to be drilling down to smaller areas, and that's the type of analysis you, you do more on a site-by-site -site basis than as a whole. We do know there's some areas with some slopes that are going to make them more challenging. Some areas with topography just makes it a little more difficult. And of course, the floodplains. Those are part of the analysis and part of something how we take into account what can we build out. So. Utility infrastructure. Uh, always a question is, do we have utilities to serve the area? The answer is yes, pretty much we do. Um, so it's a bigger question than that. Um, actually, you may not be able to tell very well from this graphic. But, there are, but the utilities have been developed over time, mainline, water, sewer, electricity, and natural gas, as a linear connection along both sides of the river, basically reflecting the inheritance of this area as, 
has intense amount of development that uses a lot of water, um, electricity, and power. We are investigating and understanding the utilities, understanding that some futures suggest that those would have to be relocated, and really getting a sense of what the capacity is and what improvements are needed. That is part of the picture in terms of setting the stage for development and making sure that we're prepared for it. So. The, um, the research agenda focused on economic analysis. We spent a bit more time on that, and, and Tom's going to go into this in more depth later, so I'll just skim over it now. This is uh, refreshing some analysis that was done in the original plan, too, in terms of what, was the, what are the market conditions now, what is the competitiveness of this area relative to other areas in the region. I think essentially, if you think about there's a certain amount of demand, we have to compete against other sites to attract it, and it has to be attractive enough that a developer wants to build here. And understanding the financial feasibility doesn't make sense as a pencil out if someone wants to build something. And the fiscal impact from the public sector perspective, what's our gain to the tax base? So we, we did some analysis of that and got some sense of what it is. And again, Tom's going to go into that in a little more depth later. But suffice to say, it's um, we're refreshing it. And I should say, when we're talking about the market, the first thing people will say is, well, everyone knows the market right now is terrible for everything. And yes, that is true. Um, our market forecast is reflecting a slightly farther out future where we're, we're going to assume that the foreclosures are somewhat dried up and, and we don't have quite the same vacancy levels. It's, a, it's, a, it's current market. <coughs> we're, a we're not just going to go with the obvious assumption that everything's crappy right now, so nothing's going to be built. That's, that's, that's going to improve, and we know it's going to improve. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the employment and business mix in this area. And, um, and, and that's because, of course, that's what the existing conditions are. And considering the mix and diversity and density and history of business development in this area, we thought it, it, it afforded a closer look and understanding what's out there now, why is it there now, there's good reasons it's there, and, and what does that mean for the future. We did a, a sector analysis that looked at the type of businesses that are out there and the sort of patterns. It's not, it's not random. There's a lot of trends in what we see. Understanding where they're distributed and where they're located. Um, understanding the industrial land, what is on our sites, not just here but elsewhere. Um, that you think, well, there's buildings and then there's parking lots and there's storage. Um, that's basically all our industrial land has something on it. You know, there's very little just that's just plain grass. So we have some a sense, a better sense of what our inventory of industrial land is and how it's being used. Employee origins, understanding where people live who work here. And actually the business survey, which is more substantial than all of these, um, uh, where I'm um, and where Rebecca and Andy are our partners in business development. <coughs> right there, it's in Manhattan. And our, our, um, have been very actively involved in the business survey work. And some of you were businesses may have, um, that have been involved in that. If not, they'd probably love to talk to you. Um, we had a, a survey that went out, and we got about 50 responses, which is pretty good. Um, understanding why people are here, what they like about the area, what they don't like, their plans for the future. That information is being summarized, of course, protecting the identity of the individual respondents, but used it as information <coughs> for planning for the future. And that was also included with the number of one-on-one -on -one visits to sites to sort of get more, more in-depth, more discussion in terms of not just where, where they are, but also from the city's perspective, how, how can we assist you, if there's ways we can assist you, and how can we work with you. So understanding the history, understanding the, well, who's going to who's here and why they're here. Freight infrastructure and in economics. Um, there's a great deal of freight infrastructure here. Um, no surprise uh, that it has been built up around industrial uses in the area. Um, we have a couple major freight rail lines, of course the port, everyone knows, and the freight connections um, for trucking, I-94 being a major truck route. We spent some time looking at that, looking at the volumes and flows and projections and, and sort of understanding how that fits into the larger uh, we also spent some time with comparison cities. Um, if, you, if you start Googling cities with riverfront redevelopment, you get more than half the cities in America. Major, most major cities have some water, and at some point have decided they need to think about the difference on that. We spent some time sort of whittling down what are good comparisons, looking at progressive cities with a vision like ours, looking at um, older Midwestern cities with a street network like ours. Um, not to summarize it here too much, but just to say we, we're looking for best practices, innovative ideas, and what has worked elsewhere. And that is being incorporated in our analysis and our reporting. Okay, I'm going to turn it over again to Tom now to talk more about in depth about our research findings related to development, where all, where all these things have led us in terms of thoughts for the next step. Not quite recommendations yet, but thoughts as to where we're going. 
So this is some of what we've learned, and, and we're going to split up this part as well. The first way we want to talk about what we learned is to think about and put in, we've talked about a lot of topical silos, right? To, to pull those together, to think about what we've learned from all those areas about some three broad land use categories, about industrial development in this area, about office development in this area, and about residential development in this area. And I'm going to run through five bullets for each. And I'm going to do them pretty briefly. And they're going to raise some questions, which we can address later. Um, but that's important for me. So go ahead. But I'm going to start with the map first. Um, this is a, what we call a sub-area map. And it looks at our geography. Again, we're looking at Interstate 94 on the left. Well, I can have it. The magic. I put this uh, in my pocket, and my coworker said, oh, good, if there's a cat there, you can. <laughs> so um, Interstate 94 on the west, uh, we've got Marshall Avenue on the east, although this, uh, above the Falls Down area doesn't move from the east. Uh, Plymouth Avenue, Broadway, Lowry, and the Canyon Bridge is up here somewhere. <clears throat> but anyway, a couple things I want to call out in here is the purple areas are industrial employment districts. <clears throat> so these are areas that have a formal status in our comprehensive plan uh, that, um, that says essentially that we're going to preserve those as industrial areas for the foreseeable future. Uh, businesses can invest, they're not worried that they're being encroaching development of kinds that wouldn't be compatible with that. So they've got a policy designation of that kind. The red areas are commercial areas that also have a designation in our comprehensive plan. Different kinds of commercial designations. West Broadway here is a commercial corridor. The Grain Belt um, area is what we call an activity center. And the Lowry and Marshall intersection is a neighborhood commercial mode. Again, those are areas we don't foresee changes to the guidance for those areas. The rest of the areas are in this uh, funny green color. And um, those are areas that, in a sense, probably then are a little more um, potentially fluid, certainly more the subject of our Go ahead. So we're going to talk about industrial development first. And just again, I, as I said, talk through five indicators and then look at a map um, for industrial locations, stronger, strongest industrial locations. So the first is a regional forecast. <clears throat> the industrial sector is, is not expected to grow strongly in the next 10 years, a 2% growth in, of industrial space in a 10 year period. Now, having said that, this particular area along the riverfront has a lot of strong characteristics for industrial and is pretty competitive um, with other industrial areas around the region and in the city. It's got great access to the interstate, a lot of big parcels, uh, um, affordable older spaces that may not be what they're building today but are pretty serviceable for a lot of businesses. Now for these, I have to uh, say, tell you that um, our economic consultants modeled some specific uh, development types that are industrial, that are residential, that are, that are office developments, so that they could actually um, analyze the costs of building that. These are models that are present in Minneapolis, so we've had them after developments in Minneapolis. Actually model the cost of building those in today's cost, and what the value of those would be for a developer uh, after it was built, so that you could look at uh, does it work for a developer? Can they get a return on it? Because if, if they can't, then um, then you're not going to attract development in this area. And of course, none of them can right now. None of them worked right now because otherwise people would be building. But some of them came closer than others to working for a developer. Secondly, they used the same model to look at um, with the value increase on that property, with that new development, um, there's an increase in tax base. <clears throat> But there's um, also oftentimes an increase in service costs because the city, uh, from a city perspective, uh, we supply services to our residents and our, and our workers. So the fiscal impact is how does it work out for the city from a financial perspective. There are other important perspectives here, but from a tax-based perspective. Um, and then the third category is, and we haven't quantified this one yet, it's an important part of our remaining research. We know that for some, particularly of the more ambitious development scenarios, there's a fair amount of investment that needs to happen in an area to even attract developer interest. 
so that they know they're not going to be building an isolated development in an area that's not suitable for that. So that also factors into, does it work for the city? What's your upfront investment cost? <coughs> so for industrial development, um, the, um, it doesn't work very well currently for, um, for a developer. The return, uh, because there's so much vacant space out there, the return on a new industrial development wouldn't, um, doesn't come very close to uh, accounting the costs. Uh, it also uh, doesn't add appreciably to the city's tax base currently with the value of the development that you would be able to build. It does, uh, on the positive side, have pretty low um, upfront uh, context setting you know, cost uh, because you can work on a site specific. Uh, basis, you might, uh, if the city wanted to um, attract new industrial redevelopment, it could acquire a site, it could clean it up and put that uh, on the market on a site specific basis. <coughs> okay, uh, from a geographical perspective, we identified uh, locate or criteria that, in, that would attract an industrial development, things like this access to the highway, large parcels, flat, ground, access to rail is a plus. And based on that, there are a lot of areas in the upper riverfront that are suitable and attractive and strong for industrial development. All right, moving on. Uh, I don't know if any of you is keeping a scorecard, but minus, plus, plus minus, minus, plus, it's mixed. I have a question about that and, But they're all, they're all going to be mixed. Yeah, I read. I have a question about that last slide. Were they identified on that map? Yeah. Also, the stronger locations? Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, the locations that are outlined in, in the bold purple lines are considered to, to basically they have these qualities. So there's a lot of areas that are suitable for industrial development. You'll see a lot of those areas are suitable for other kinds of development as well. This is not exclusive one to another. Mm -hmm. um, what type of industrial? Because there's a big difference between I want industry and I agree. And so I'm not clear with the purple there, um, where that exactly the, the boundaries are. Right, and, and this doesn't distinguish. I think the important thing to be to, to say here is this is not a this is not a policy recommendation. This is this is evaluating what sites would be could be of interest to an industrial developer. But no, we don't distinguish it from this uh, analysis what type of industrial. I will point out, as long as we're back to the slide, that there's an area of uh, omission here that's uh, got pretty steep grades. That probably this between uh, Lowry and Allen that probably would not be of uh, primary interest to a new industrial development. Mm -hmm. All right, office development. The the forecast for growth in office space is stronger here. Eleven percent growth over ten years. Mm -hmm. In our analysis of some areas, um, in our analysis of the competitiveness of this area, we think that um, some parts of the upper riverfront could be competitive with an outside of downtown, other outside of downtown office cluster areas. Uh, it could be an area that might be similar to a Best Buy headquarters area or, or like Wells Fargo home mortgage uh, campus because it has a lot of characteristics that, um, that these businesses might all right, the gap to, what's the best way to say it? It works a little better for developers, uh, according to our model, uh, for an office developer than it would for an industrial developer. There's a gap in meeting your cost, but it's smaller. <coughs> there, there may be a fiscal return uh, to the city. It looks like there could be a fiscal return to the city in doing this type of development, depending on a lot of things, depending on density, of the development and other factors. So it looks like our model showed a modest uh, uh, improvement to the tax base uh, by this kind of redevelopment. And uh, finally, we do think to be attractive to, you know, Medtronic coming and setting up a uh, headquarters area, there is some upfront public investment that would be helpful to track that kind of development. So we are looking at some front end public investment for this kind of are people mostly following this, or am I losing everyone? <laughs> Nod your head if you're mostly following this. 
This uh, information you're presenting is strictly from a model and <coughs> is uh, predictive. It's strictly from a financial model based in the current time. Time is going to change these things too. A lot right? of assumptions, in fact, possibly. Lots all of assumptions. assumptions. We're just we're just working at this from a lot of different yeah. angles to try to develop information that can be useful to uh, to decisions. Can we add that there there is a report that has all the assumptions laid out in the frame, which is really into the details. that's available on our website. So for anyone who wants to really understand all the different pieces behind mm -hmm. it, we'll, we'll have we have that available. They're on the back table too. Yes, and they're back here too. Yeah. If you're involved in this green area now, what, is, what are you to assume that we're not in the long-term plan, or we are? Or you, is every, everything that's in the green area going to change? Well, remember that everything in the green area has development guidance, has policy associated with right with it right now, right. and and big parts of it are proposed to change. Uh, we haven't recommended any different guidance to this point. Yeah. How do you reconcile the existing businesses right. that are in the green area versus the theoretical ones in the purple? Um, We're sitting in the green area, and I guess I'm just wondering right, what's right. that, what's the, that mean? The, the biggest difference today between the green areas and the purple areas, if, if you're looking at, for instance, this, is that um, the policy guidance for this is existing policy guidance. It's not, it's not any changes that we're looking at. The existing policy guidance for the purple area is for it to stay industrial. And the existing policy guidance for the green area is it for, for it to be redeveloped to residential <coughs> in the future. That may change. The city council could change some of those recommendations. But those are the, that's the existing policy guidance for that area. <coughs> it's, it's a vision that happened over a 50-year period of time. So in terms of geography, office, new, a new office cluster would be looking for a, a freeway access. They'd be looking for that freeway visibility to put its corporate logo. Uh, it doesn't mind hills quite so much. It starts to want amenities. The riverfront is an asset. Uh, nearby retail would be an asset. So these are the transit service for the employees would be an asset. So these are the things that, that office development might want. And based on that, We've identified in these three areas what we think are the strongest areas within the upper river front for that type of development. The uh, off of West Broadway, you can see the coal class headquarters is this type of development and is, is in that area. Uh, we think it may be possible to attract office development uh, off of the Dowling exit, and then there's the existing rain belt um, area that, that's got office development. Mm -hmm. All right. Residential development. It's got even a stronger growth uh, predicted in a regional level over the next 10 years than, than office does. Um, competitiveness with other parts of the city. It is, um, it's not real competitive with a lot of the areas around the city uh, that are seeing most residential growth. Most residential growth in the city right now is downtown. It's in the uptown area and it's on our transit corridors. So this is a, this is a, the, um, a secondary interest uh, to residential development. Blurring the lines and thinking big picture. Right. When we modeled uh, these residential developments, we did a rental development, we did a condo development. <clears throat> Again, the, the, uh, the gap for a developer was uh, on the small side compared to industrial developments. A little closer to making that, for that to be possible from a development perspective. Um, it looked like from our model that it may well add to, um, to the uh, tax base um, and possibly significantly, uh, but depends on a lot of things. Again, the density of the development, the mix between ownership and rental, those are two of the important factors. <clears throat> the public investment at the front end to attract residential development to some of these areas we think is very high. Um, might need to, well, I was going to talk a little bit more about what we mean about that context, and she's going to give a little bit more into detail on the kind of public investments that we think are necessary. Uh, to attract uh, this um, this uh, type of new development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this analysis in the housing assuming market rate housing? And have you looked at the impact it's on the existing surrounding housing market by doing the development? Mm -hmm. It's not, well, the, the model is from a market perspective, yes. Um, so the model 
thought about it from a completely private developer perspective. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't want a mix of affordable and market rate housing, but we modeled a private development. Does this assume that there are, is no increase in amenities? No, and I was going to get back to this, yeah. but we think to attract residential development, we would we would need to have that be part of the development. And, I, and it also may relate to how do you get attract good transit service, which housing wants. Right. So the location criteria for housing, and, and, and like in the other scenarios, it doesn't mean I read. <laughs> Are these scenarios based on the market condition as if there was a park there or without the park there yet? No, they were modeled on the assumption that there would be a really nice park there. Before, before something. Right. Wouldn't transit sort of follow population? Yep. I mean, if you had a development and had people, right. then you'd get transit. Right, right. Okay, um, so housing wants these things. Uh, housing de developers are looking for these kind of characteristics. You're not going to find them all in a lot of places, but the more of them you have, the more attractive it is to development. And based on these characteristics and from our conversation with area developers, um, this area on the east side of the river is really in the upper riverfront, the strongest area uh, to attract resident, new residential development. We've also highlighted the areas on the west side of the river that we feel are strongest. They have most um, that have the, most, the greatest number of these kind of characteristics. What are those numbers in the area? Excuse me? Those numbers oh, you know, this is a map we've used to um, to uh, identify the different policies that relate to these different areas. So uh, there's a spreadsheet connected to yeah. the references those numbers. Cordelia. Do you describe what the differences between the dotted lines and the solid ones? The dotted lines are, are we think would be of secondary interest to housing developers. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I would think that with the um, if you're trying to attract if you're trying to attract people into the area, that uh, not transportation, but the, the quality of the housing, you're gonna also you're gonna have a, a increase in tax base and the cost of the taxes living along the river. So that's going to defer, that's going to deter, uh, deter people from wanting people that, of, of uh, middle class, lower, whatever that, pay, that don't want to pay you know the high taxes material from even coming in the area. So the transportation people that can afford it are also going to be able to afford cars and other things to be, be able to get them back and forth. So I wouldn't think transportation would be a, a, a factor in that. I would think it's key. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think mass transfer or something like that would be a factor. I think most people are going to have to drive automobiles. Well, I think that would be a lot. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we put in a slide on retail development. It's not a primary development type. We're not going to cover 50 acres of retail. It serves the other development. <clears throat> it likes um, nearby density. And it also does better if there's a drive-by uh, customer traffic. And so based on these, in addition to the commercial areas that are already um, uh, in our plan, we we think, depending on the kind of development nearby, it may be able to support some additional retail at Lowry uh, and at Dow. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some of the red areas are solid, and some just to have a border. Uh, what's the difference between those? Well, the solid areas are those that are already designated in our comprehensive plan as as, um, as commercial areas. So the the ones with the border here are additional areas that we think could um, could attract retail. Don't forget right. that Lowry stretch is elevated, though, where you it is so it retail. It's mm -hmm. going to be elevated when they're done. That's so we got to think more three-dimensionally. <laughs> that could be true. We could have our own skyway. <laughs> <laughs> it could be true. So maybe I should be drawn from the railroad tracks on back, and not all the way to the river. Good point. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Hyla. Uh, who's going to talk about some other elements of this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Good luck. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, this is, I think we've actually covered a number of these because all you bright people are anticipating all the issues and we're trying to, trying to juggle in, look, in doing this analysis. Um, the first, so talk about this context, this idea of context setting. This is something we heard st very strongly from the development community that if you're expecting a developer, expecting a, uh, a resident, 
especially when who's buying something, or a business, especially someone who's building their own facility, not just renting, um, to invest in an area, they want to have some certainty that their, their neighborhood is, is a well-tended area, has amenities, has things that people want. Um, and some uses, especially residential, need more of that than others. If you're talking about someone buying an urban condo, the expectation is that they can walk to a coffee shop or a restaurant, a nice park, maybe just some good schools in the area. There's, there's some certain things that come along with a package deal that make an area attractive. Um, and that, and, and transit service, of course, is one of those as well. And if you look at this plan for the transit network, which again, maybe you can't all see, but the upper riverfront is sort of bracketed by high frequency transit routes, but not really had one itself. Of course, you're talking a chicken egg situation here. If you, you don't have transit until you have people who ride it. But again, that's something that we need to think about in terms of how um, this is moving forward. Indeed, of course, um, you can't have business uh, with their own customers. So again, some of these things follow and some of these things lead. But again, when we're talking about competitiveness of the area, we have to think about the package deal that someone's buying into when they move there. Um, upfront public costs. Again, a common theme, and I and sort of skipping ahead a little bit to the end, this is going to be the focus of a lot of our sort of final phases of research before we get to the recommendations. Um, understanding a higher value, we say more risk, more reward type of scenario. Higher value development means more context. It might very well mean more public dollars expended. And a lot of our focus could be on saying, if we have a future we want, what is the fiscal path to making that happen? We can't just assume money will drop out of the sky. <coughs> what, are, what are the financial tools? How much needs to be expended? Where is the logical places to start with that? And how do you make these investments? We have a wonderful example and a leader in the park board who is already sort of out there looking towards that. Um, on, this, on the other city side and the public side, we're thinking about these other types of things. We're talking about sites that are too small for development to be, to be assembled. There's environmental cleanup costs associated with everything. The, we, we understand the street and utility infrastructure in some areas, even if it's, if it's present and decent, it's a bit shabby and not very inspiring. There's some expenses that need to be taken into account or certainly can be addressed with that sort of analysis. Other considerations, just a quick one, and this is kind of on the obvious side, but just understanding that sometimes higher density development is needed to support that. Um, we have an example of a residential high rise versus a single family home. It's a very easy one to understand. But even on the industrial side, you build something that's just a warehouse that employs three people and stores big piles of nothing, it might not, well, of merchandise, it might not be a very dense use and a very low cost per square foot. And again, not really viable in the area when you talk about new construction. So talking about a use that's more intensive, more high value, is um, might, maybe what makes the difference between whether a project works versus doesn't work, um, especially building new. And I should say, all these scenarios are talking about new development. There are, exist, of course, existing examples of everything, and they have their own economic models. This is assuming that you're building something brand new as opposed to just rehabbing. Of course, it's a different story entirely in terms of how that works. Um, timing and phasing. This is a very key thing we're talking about on um, a 50-year plan. Obviously, we're not suggesting, even whatever our 50-year vision is, we can't suggest that we're just going to sit around and wait 50 years until something happens. There has to be steps to get us there in terms of investment. And in terms of thinking, even if an area is transitioning, something's there in the meantime, and that something could be a very productive, useful thing in the meantime. That is going to be a part of it, and the, and the time dimension is a key part of our recommendations that we need to pull together. And so, as we have talked about earlier, some uses could happen incrementally in the short term. Some are going to take a little bit longer to set the stage for them. Park development. I keep mentioning this, but it's, it's worth repeating. Um, that new park development <coughs> is a catalyst. We think it's probably one of the major catalysts for um, inspiring people to think about the riverfront in a different way and think of investing in higher value futures, um, whatever that means. Um, location of the speech will affect the viability of development and, 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 and any type of adjacent development we heard from developers, pretty much every type of development can find some use for a park. Some are more, are more active than others, but we do need to think about that. And in terms of working with MRDI and the park board, we're thinking in terms of how this mutually beneficial relationship between the parks and whatever is next to them, and how we make sure that's, that's um, maximized. Uh, neighborhood connections. Um, so the theoretical question is, for a neighborhood, is it more important to have sort of vertical access up and down the river or to have those horizontal points that pull you across to the river. And I bet a lot of people would say both are important. But when you're talking about a strategy for development, where is the, where is the important part to stop? Sorry. And um, we're also talking about not just the physical connections, but the connections of what these uses bring to the area. Industrial and office uses bring jobs. Jobs are good. 
residential to use is bring people and maybe pass these for additional amenities that weren't there already. That is also good. Um, and also there's the, the more trailing but very important pieces of transit and retail. So thinking about those benefits, thinking about how this sort of spins off and impacts hopefully in a positive way the surrounding areas is an important part as well. Um, timeline, just really quickly where we are. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up our research. We've been going, doing this for about a year and a half, and we know it's a long time time period, but there's a lot to cover, as you can tell. So we're doing this right. Uh, May through July, so this, the, the, over the summer, we're going to be spending some time wrapping up those things. And as we said before, the focus now is the cost of context setting, public costs. Maybe not all public, maybe some are private. They're associated with um, setting the stage for development futures, making people who can invest money in development, whatever that development is, feel comfortable with this is a place that is a good, a good place to um, do what, what they do. Um, we can't do it all alone. We have to work with the private sector, but we want to make sure that we're setting the appropriate framework and we have a pass forward. Um, next, we have a series of public meetings late summer. We'll make sure that everyone here, please sign in. We want to make sure that everyone gets an invite to those meetings so that they can respond and hear about them. And, and aiming towards September, we're going to talk about the recommendations to the city council. That's actually getting to the point where we're saying, okay, these are the changes we recommend you think about before you go the false plan. The council still can make their, they're gonna make their own decision. They, they can listen to us or not. But we're gonna be making these recommendations at that point. What tweaks are needed to the plan? Assuming there are some, they could say no. Um, and before we go to the next phase of implementation, which says, now what? Now what is the next step we take? And we want to make sure the city has, city council again has the recommendations, plus the th thought of, if you are adopting this, this is the plan to move forward um, and to make sure that we're moving in that direction in a positive sense. So that's our time frame for right now. Get some questions up here for discussion. I, I think you folks could also think of some good questions on your own. You already have. So I just want to leave these up here for your perusal. Um, just say, what, what, what do you think are your priorities for the area? Are you, what do you think about density? Um, what do you think about the timeline? And I think almost more, most importantly, what, what ha should happen now? Um, if you were king or queen for a day, what is what is what do you see as important priorities now? And Cordelia, are you taking notes on this? I am taking notes, and this would be a great time in terms of your presentation and getting <coughs> hands raised in terms of where you are. Let us know if you're ready for questions from the audience. Sure. We're yes. getting towards the end. One of the things I want to throw out real quick is we may want to have a follow-up meeting now that we have all the information <laughs> to take more time to sit down as as interested people and look at these four questions so we don't have to answer all these today we can have another meeting and maybe Hila and uh, Tom would join us to think about some of this and think about these questions so I just want to frame it that we don't have a lot of time left today but with that said oh okay so David you raise their hand first it was over okay. Okay. I just want to pull an additional question yeah. it seems like a lot of this is the chicken or the egg issue. There's a maximum, if you build it, they will come. I don't think in this economic economy you're going to pull that one off. If you don't build it right, they won't come. So it, has anybody studied other, other models in other cities where they've been successful at developing and see what they did first and what kind of things, there's tipping points. If you do this and this and this, <coughs> you'll tip this over to that, and that'll happen. Has anybody studied the tipping points of the other developments in other cities that have been successful and have done this on a large scale and developed a model that seems to work better? It, just in terms of figuring out, because you're asking, you're, you're, you've got all the right questions, but. There, this has been done, it's been figured out, there's better, there's best practices, and I don't hear that question being studied. <coughs> well, the City Council is very interested in that question as well. <laughs> and, it, and it is a part of our scope um, and part of our next step, not just to quantify the cost of setting the stage for new development, but also to look at the development tools that are required for that and some strategies, and to think about are those strategies that we currently have available for this. And if not, you know, how are we going to adjust it? You know, I see all this future stuff, and what I don't see uh, addressed here is the people are here now, the businesses that are here now, 
people have been paying taxes for 25 years, see them going up for 25 years. You know, what we're trying to plan our futures too. And I got 24, 25 families that depend on having this business operational, and I don't see that addressed at all. I feel like we are addressing that to the extent of. Maybe well, what I see is that you're saying that we're not going to be in the long-term plan. That's what, that's what you showed me. We have, that's, we're not, you're not in the long-term plan right now. This is the opportunity for evaluating the feasibility of the long-term plan and also thinking about what's happening in the meantime. We have actually spent a fair amount of time sort of trying to get a sense of what's out there now and the value that area brings. And I would say that we know that there's been businesses here that, that have been here for, in some form or fashion for close to a century. So there's a great deal of investment in this area. We want to acknowledge and honor that and know that that's not going anywhere tomorrow and that nobody has the money to buy out all the inventory that's here here right now anyway. So we, we I, maybe no, it's... No, I think what's going to be addressed is are, are we going to fit in there long term? That's a, and nobody's coming to ask me anything. I'm there every day. Nobody's ever talked to me. Council Member Hoff said what's going to come Well, I think, uh, sir, you have one of the, um, one of the nicest properties along the riverfront and taking good care of it for the last um, very many years. And um, those are the kinds of businesses that we, we want to keep uh, in the area. So we're not, this plan um, uh, is not about getting rid of businesses. It's about uh, looking at relationships between businesses as uh, this plan evolves. And so that, your, your uh, comment is extremely valuable. But I think it's important to know uh, that it's not about getting rid of the businesses that are there. No, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we included a plan. That's all I'm worried about. I, I'm not saying anybody can come and tell us about tomorrow. But, you know, I'm, I'm ready to pass some business on to the next generation. i got to make some decisions here. You know, do I do it here? Do I do it in another city? Or what, what do I do? Well, two things I would say is where there are transitions, um, the assumption would be that <coughs> businesses, property owners, um, are, that are acquired for transition have to be given, um, have to be, their land has to be purchased at a price that they're willing to take. That's one assumption. Um, <clears throat> we don't, the city can't condemn property for retail. So it's all got to be willing sellers. And the second is when you, when you look at long range transitions, <clears throat> and this is tricky, but you do have the opportunity to be patient and wait till businesses <coughs> may be at a point in their life cycle where someone wants to get out of business or where they're ready to expand and move anyway. So some of that can happen. We've been here 90 years, so I don't think we're going to <laughs> yeah, We've been there over 75 years. So, uh, yeah. and we don't mix too well with uh, residential development close by. And, we, and that's and definitely part of our, the features. We're not, any development scenario which involves sort of helter skelter development here and there is, is not going to be very strong for any type of use. It's, 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 and that's, it, we're at a, again, we're at a point where we're not actually making recommendations, so everything you say here is informing what we're doing next, but we, we are glad to hear. Another issue to look at, I think, is what is the highest and best use of the land? And does the business have to be on the river? And could the business be somewhere else? Because you can't have a riverfront trail and green space anywhere else. It has to be on the river. And to respect our river, the green space and the public space needs to be on the river. So that's, that's part of it, is could the business move somewhere else and may, maybe even be in a better spot? So it's not, again, getting rid of business or anti-business. We all want jobs, we all want healthy. Well, I noticed this business went off, the, uh, this building here went off the tax rolls and turned into a city. They got a pretty nice view for a city operation here. And that was taken off the tax rolls at forty or $50,000 a year this building was paying. Which is another issue. Right. So <laughs> well, we're talking about I guess I guess if I go, I hope this building goes too, and there's residential here. Is what I'm saying. Okay. They were they were paying taxes somewhere else before they were paying taxes here. I understand. <laughs> they took this building out. We had, of a, we had a question here. I, I realize it's a really complicated process, and, that, and and there are a lot of different moving pieces in all of this. Just from a process standpoint, I'm curious: Have you factored into your assumptions? Um, what the potential impact is at various points in time for um, further recession, economic recession? Okay. I'd have to say no. That in a long-term plan like this, we assume that there's going to be business cycles that come to go. Yeah, the, the, the market analysis is sort of an average over time. At any given point, it's probably wrong, but over a 20-year period, up and down, it'll, the idea is it'll average out. 
couple of questions over here. No? Well, I'll make my kind of broken record comment that I make at every one of these meetings. There's no realization when you go through any of this that you have anything to do with the river. There is no point where the river is ever used. There's no point where you do anything except look at it. it might as well be a valley, it might as well be a highway, or, or anything else. And the principal thing that a river has in it is water. And we really ought to be thinking about how we would use the river for the kinds of things that people should use a river for. Boating, for things in the river, for swimming, for cleaning it up, for wildlife. The only people who've ever, the uh, TLS plan, at least seems to contemplate that they are dealing with the river. Absolutely. So that's again uh, my complaint. I think you can go through through everything that was written here today, and there's nothing that implies that you're doing anything with the river except for the Over here? Yeah. Two points. Number one, um, I certainly perceive from your presentation that it's, to me at least, my own personal opinion, it's not business friendly. So I don't know if that's the way you intended or not, but uh, I'm concerned that you did account for the business and industry on the river. Number two, uh, is this presentation available on your website, or can it be handed out? Can we, it can will we, be shortly. Yes. Okay, I'd like to talk to you about feed state. Uh, tomorrow. Well, tomorrow. <laughs> That's, good. That's, That's pretty good. It's easy enough. Okay. The, reports, the reports said it's based on, on the website. Okay. And, wh and what, what is that web address? Excuse me? What is that web address for that? We'll write it down. Okay. Uh, there. Oh, there it is. Um, I'm going to go back to one of your slides where it talked about it does show the industry continuing, I think, on the other side of the tracks and says that it will be buffered from the residential. Um, this one? Um, buffered from residential use, which um, from my neighborhood, which you showed on your slide, currently that is not. So I'm assuming, should this plan go forward, that there would be a buffer. That would be question number one. And number two, as far as the tax base, somebody was talking about taxes. I know that our little tiny neighborhood there, which it's so small you can't even see it. Um, in 2007, that guy paid about a quarter million in property taxes. So to me, that sounds like a huge, maybe that's just a lot of money to me, but it's a lot of money for that small space of land in property taxes that we see. It is. Um, I don't know how to address your, I didn't quite understand your but it says that access, that you know, there's still going to be the industry there and there's going to be buffers from residential use. Right this now, our residential use is not buffered from the heavy industry. Right, and this is, um, this is not a scenario that we're recommending. These are the outlined uh, areas, are areas that we think are suitable for industry based on this criteria. Okay. So there the candidates, candidate. if there was no, imagine a world where there was no development guidance. This land would be good candidates for locating a business based on this criteria. Yeah. So that's why some of the maps showed some of the same areas, but for other purposes as well. Different types of business. But what she's so saying but, is it's But in the buffering, um, industries do like locations that are not immediately adjacent to residential properties. Like just, as, uh, yeah. just as residential um, development wants to locate where it's not immediately adjacent to industry. Tom, I'm just going to do a time yeah, check sure. here. Um, we <laughs> said we'd be done at 6.30. Are you guys all right staying a few more minutes? We or? can stay a few more minutes. So okay, we can, um, so we're going to go ahead. Sorry, we're going over time, but this isn't school, so if you need to leave, just go ahead. Well, you know, and let's face it, we, we brought out a tremendous amount of research Gave you the top layer. Didn't have time to, to you know, to show the world the work that went into it. So it's basically like a lot of provocative statements yeah. that's going to hit a lot of people wrong in different ways. We need an advanced <laughs> course. Yes. That's what right. I think we need a follow up. And I just want to check in. We plan these upper river forums monthly um, through the summer, which is a tough time to have public meetings like this. But this is a big deal. This is will shape the future of the riverfront. The next. 
uh, community meeting is led by the Minneapolis Riverfront Development Initiative on June 22nd. Put that on your calendars because that's looking at the park development. Would people be interested in convening again to have a similar and more discussion in July? Raise your hand if you'd like to, if you think this would be helpful to come back. Okay, why don't we just say that right now? And then it was July 28th, I believe, was our date? the end of the month. So uh, July 28th, we'll send out a notice. And does that work for your timeline? Can time you guys line? make it? Two at the end uh, of July. Okay, be happy to again. Okay. So, allotting more time. Add questions that we don't get to today. Allotting more time for Q&A in the next meeting. Yes, there'll be less presentation. More in depth, any group that would be interested. And there are comment sheets. We'll keep you okay, before, before people go, there are comment sheets each of you have received. Please use those and turn them in. And for those of you who would like to stay, we are going to stay and have more discussion here. So for another 15 minutes. We'll go past seven. We'll go to I, we'll go I'd like to point out that by having this in such a rush time frame, the residents of the north side are not going to be able to participate because they are going to be For those of you who are choosing to stay, to leave, please be quiet so that the discussion can continue for those who want to stay for discussion. There was a point made about not rushing this review process since some people on North Side are not available. Any other questions? Just yeah. I think this discussion is fun as but I think we need to back up when you take a look at whether this is sound, makes sound economic sense, whether it's a particular uh, individual uh, or... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. What has happened. Historically, not just uh, here, but throughout the country, we have tended to... Uh, make decisions that have negatively impacted communities along the river. We've polluted it, we've dumped raw sewage in, we've done a number of things that have negatively impacted the, the neighborhoods surrounding those things, and rivers and waterways. In what we've tried to do, I mean, again, collectively in the country, is look back now, because what happened then, because we so negatively impacted those areas, those neighborhoods, is that the residential and other attractive uh, uh, elements moved away from the river because it was so heavily polluted, it was so heavily impacted. And now we've had the opportunity with some time and experience to look back and say, wait a minute, we can change this, we can clean up. For example, uh, the state of Minnesota is uh, uh, funded and the communities have funded the sewer separation project. Tens of millions of dollars to clean up. Now we have a, a very clean uh, river. There are programs, for example, like the Critical Areas Act, which the state provided to designate this area of protection. It's, it's a national park now. There's a number of things that have been put in place in the plan. And I guess uh, then you really get into how can you maximize the value for the community, the broader neighborhood, the broader society, and how does that make the most sense? And I think picking up uh, what is said before, is it's the water, it's the amenities along the water, and when you look at your development scenarios and what you can attract to it, you need to do the amenities. So I think one of the things that you have to take a look at uh, in the Buffalo Falls plan, it talks about the concept of that you have parkland and you have parkways along the river, and, and that's part of the integral part of, of uh, starting to try and do that other development. And uh, on that, I would uh, then suggest that you need to look at the publicly owned assets, publicly owned land stuff, seem to be the natural place to start to move those because if you want to, whatever the timeline is, if you never get to putting in the amenities, it pushes back the ability to make those other changes. So just as steps to clean up the water, to get the designations for the park and all that have laid groundwork, I think it's now important to lay the groundwork to get those amenities along the river put in place. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I guess the people with the questions all left. <laughs> all right, um, we've talked about some upcoming meetings. June 22nd is the MRDI. Did Mary leave? Mm -hmm.
She left. Okay. Um, if, if you want information on that, that's also on the city, the park board's website somewhere, mm -hmm. or you can contact us. Um, it's out there. Is that listed on the handout? Yeah, it's yeah. Minneapolis. What about a boat landing? Anybody, are they going to put a boat landing? Yeah, boat landings there? are definitely in, in the plan. Yep. Yeah. Where exactly but, and how many is a question, but definitely. Well, want to thank you all for coming. And you'll see on your agendas that next Thursday, oh, that sign, same, uh, same place, but a little bit later, 638, we need to get in the water. Water. discussion of power at the falls. As many of you have known, there have been some controversial discussions about hydropower at Sandy yeah, Falls. So we'll just be talking, it's just an informational session, it doesn't make sense. Um, but you can learn more about hydropower uh, at the falls. Uh, and then we mentioned earlier the uh, June 22nd, Minneapolis River Fund Development Initiative, 6 to 8 here, and the Above the Falls Citizen Advisory Committee meets on the 28th of June. We'll look for another public forum on the Upper River in July. Um, thank you for coming. Please leave your comment sheets or send me an email with your comments. Uh, we will be sure to forward all that information to Tom and Hyla, as well as use that to inform planning these future forums. Uh, a few key things is teasers coming up. Both the Lowry Bridge and Plymouth Bridge are due for reconstruction. We're trying to make sure that bike and pedestrian accommodations are made there. Uh, and the uh, Minneapolis River Partnership is doing an Above the Falls destinations map. So if you see the display back there with all those pink and yellow tabs on it, um, we're looking for businesses to advertise in that, but also we'll have outings and activities to bring people down to the river. So look for those coming up. But you're, you're someone going to talk about what's happening with the new plans for the Lowry Bridge? Um, we're, it's in flux. Um, there's some well, challenges it's getting it. the wrong way. Yeah. So, <laughs> why is it in flux? I know there's a meeting next Wednesday at noon that some of us are going to. There's. The original plan for the Lowry Bridge included biking and walking trails on what I call the sidewalk, as well as commuter bike trails and connections to the north-south trails that are part of the above the falls. Apparently, some of that's in question, may have been taken off due to funding constraints, but um, um, if anybody's interested, we're trying to work on that and, and meet with the bridge people and the well, bike people. And the maybe you should invite some of us because they made a commitment to us at the legislature when we gave them one year, they um, got yeah. half of all of the bridge money in the I'm not state. in charge. That we have nothing to do okay. with it. That's okay, the problem. But come and join us in talking to them. Don't <laughs> worry, don't worry. Um, I begged my way onto a meeting for next Wednesday. We can't even get the information. They're not calling us back. They, I was on the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee for the Lower Bridge, and they changed it after the, the bridge, after we met. So we, we don't know what the information is. That's Who's part of the problem. Hennepin County, the bridge builders. Um, so it's very confusing. And so some of this may, it, it's confusing, is, is what's going on. But the rumors are that um, things have been eliminated due to funding cuts. People want you to eliminate uh, um, auto track. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. There we go. So if you have more questions about Hennepin County's bridge, uh, Mark Stengwein is the county commissioner for the area. Um, Mary is the co-facilitator of the Bubble Falls Citizen Advisory Committee, and they did discuss this and figured out, okay, is there something we can do to help? And like I said, we're going to a bike meeting with Hennepin County on Wednesday at noon. Anybody is welcome to join us. At that point, we'll know a little more. We'll have some drawings, and we can involve you. And, uh, and I want to talk to you. Don't leave yet. I would suggest you contact Jim Rube or Robert Byers, B-Y-E-R-S. And their staff for Hennepin County. Okay. I see a few more hands going up, but I want to make sure people and know that they can go if they need to, but... I'm yeah. just going to say one quick enough. Yeah. If, if, anybody, if anybody hasn't been by the falls recently, you should stop down there. It's pretty spectacular. Which one? St. <laughs> Anthony Falls. Yeah. Minion Falls is too, but... Thank you again for coming.